On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Prime XBT. First Republic has now become the second largest bank to fail in U.S. history, taking over the dubious distinction from Silicon Valley Bank. Three of the four largest ever U.S. bank failures have occurred in the past two months alone. Now, regulators seized First Republic Bank and struck a deal to sell the bulk of its operations to J.P. Morgan Chase, which is now the biggest bank in the U.S. and the biggest bank in the world by market cap. CEO Jamie Dimon says that this part of the crisis is over. And President Biden says the banking system is safe and sound and that more actions will be taken to further ensure that. So is the worst of the banking crisis over or is it just beginning? Could cracks in the commercial real estate sector bring down more banks? Well, investment titan Charlie Munger thinks they could. And he's warning that U.S. banks are full of bad commercial property loans which account for 43% of small bank loans in the U.S. And Elon Musk is echoing a similar concern. Well, my next guest says that he expects more failures, which will lead to consolidation in the banking sector, potentially paving the way for a CBDC or central bank digital currency. And that this could all spiral into a hundred plus annual inflation within the next two or three years. Andrew Axelrod is a global macro commentator, as featured in Zero Hedge and Bitcoin magazine. He is a top LinkedIn contributor, with his posts averaging a million views per month. And he's spent his career working with some of the largest asset allocators across America, Europe, and Asia Pacific, and now educates family offices and professionally money managers on digital assets. Good to have you with us, Andrew. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Um, I just wanted to say up front, I'm a longtime viewer, so it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk to your audience. It's a little, I won't lie, it's a little surreal uh, talking to you. Uh, I'm afraid, you know, it, it, I get, I kind of get what John Hinckley might have felt like when he felt like the TV was talking to him. Uh, <laughs> but in this case, it's, it's actually real. So <laughs> I'm, re- I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, hopefully you're not going to be inspired uh, with any assassination attempts like John Hinckley Jr. Appreciate the sentiment. And I too have been following your work and your articles on LinkedIn. So it's really good to have you on the show. But we want to get some of your bigger ominous forecasts there. But before we do that, let's just recap where we are with First Republic. Initially rescued by rival banks in the aftermath of Silicon Valley Bank's failure, It was limping along for weeks after a group of America's biggest banks came to the rescue with a $30 billion deposit. But depositors at the bank got nervous. They began moving their money from First Republic. And then First Republic announced that it lost $100 billion in deposits, mostly in March. And we just saw the stock sell off since then. This forced regulators to step in and they sold all of the deposits and most of the assets to JP Morgan Chase. So that's where we are now. Break that down for us, where we are, what happens next. Yeah, absolutely. So I was reading the headlines over the weekend um, and again this morning and I just, Michelle, I was like asking myself, haven't we seen this movie before? And then I was thinking back and it's like, oh, right, yeah, I'm old enough to remember that way back in the old days of, of March of this year, uh, we had the other second biggest bank failure. That was, of course, Silicon Valley Bank, um, which has had you know that sort of dubious title. It's been snapped up by First Republic now. It's the new second biggest bank failure. Silicon Valley Bank slid down to, to third place. So, I mean, we've seen in the last... Just in the last three weeks, uh, we've seen three out of four of the largest uh, bank failures in U.S. history. Of course, Washington Mutual takes the cherry back in 2008, but certainly within uh, recent memory, these are tremendous failures. Signature Bank uh, with 110 billion, Silicon Valley Bank, SVB with 209 billion, and now First Republic Bank with 213 billion. These people talk about these are domestic banks, these are smaller banks that are failing. I mean, these are that may be the case. I wouldn't call them small by any measure. These are really gigantic banks. These are huge numbers. This isn't child's play. 
And I think it speaks to really a, a larger trend that's been ongoing, um, depending on how far back you want to rewind. I mean, we've had at the turn of the century, not of this one, but in the 1900s, uh, we had 35,000 banks in the US. You fast forward to the 1990s, that number got whittled down to just around 10,000. And now we're about at half of that, at 5,000, the exact same um, trend we've seen in Europe since 2009, the number of uh, their version of the FDIC insured banks, they've dropped by 33%. So what we're really seeing here is this trend playing out. We're seeing a massive consolidation um, and it's it's really unprecedented. It seems right. to be picking up steam in fact. So if you hear the number, okay, 5,000 banks, 5,000 FDIC insured banks, I mean, who cares, right? Um, that's plenty. Do we need 35,000 banks? Well, that sort of belies, um, if, you, if you look at the percentage of deposits, it's actually a much more severe picture. So the big four banks, uh, Citi, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Bank of America, they represent about half of deposits nationwide. So, okay, sure, there's 5,000 banks, but the reality is half of deposits are sitting with those four. So I think this recent collapse um, or the slew of recent collapses really sort of speaks to that trend that we're seeing. Yeah. Out. And I, of course, want to get your thoughts on how this trend continues to play out. But in the meantime, First Republic Bank, I believe 14th largest bank in the U.S., as you say, sizable bank indeed. And yet we have equity markets closing up today on this news, shrugging it off. What, what do you make of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's positive for markets in the sense that they're aware that the money spigots are getting opened up again. I mean, every time a bank gets bailed out, that's good for asset prices. I think it sets terrible incentives. It's bad for the system as a whole. But in terms of um, uh, a flood of money coming into the system, that's always positive for asset prices. So I think that's why you're seeing equities rally. Certainly you've seen uh, Bitcoin is up 100% off its bottom. It touched 16,000 a few weeks back. Now it's almost back up at 30,000. So whenever um, big government comes in, bails out these players, that's always a, a market signal that, okay, get ready guys. Um, floodgates uh, for more money is about to open up. Yeah, which is not necessarily a good omen for what it means that forces those floodgates to open up. But let's focus on, again, First Republic Bank here. We have Jamie Dimon telling analysts in a call shortly after the deal was announced that, and I quote him, this part of the crisis is over. He said there are only so many banks that were offsides this way. There may be another smaller one, but this pretty much resolves them all. This part of the crisis is over. Different view from Gary Cohn, who used to be the chief operating officer at Goldman Sachs. And he says, I don't think we're going to get three and done. Crises don't sort of end this easily. This is not the end. So you're clearly in alignment, I believe, with Gary Cohn. Explain what you think could happen here. Is this the end or are we headed for a lot more failures? No, I think this is just the beginning. So what it, it's sometimes it's a little bit hard to see the forest for the trees. Um, it seems like these are all sort of unconnected um, instances. You know, there's always a, a good excuse at the ready, you know, um, rate hikes or, um, you know, supply chains breaking. Um, you know, these are all sort of or, or individual bank runs. These are all sort of uh, special circumstances, you know, 2008 so-called special circumstances, 2008 was supposed to be that once in a lifetime financial crisis. As we're seeing now, that certainly isn't the case. As said, three out of the four biggest bank failures have just happened in the past few weeks. So that certainly wasn't a one-off. Uh, I also wouldn't call it a black swan. So this is far from resolved. If anything, I think this speaks to a systemic weakness um, within the entire structure um, of the system. And we, we can get into that if you want, but certainly, um, you know, plugging these few holes um, within the system with, with these specific bailouts, it, it really just kicks the can down the road. It doesn't resolve anything long term. Well, let's get into why you think this is a systemic symptom. 
Yeah, it's a little bit like playing a huge version of financial Jenga. So people seem to think that if you're, you know, uh, consolidating, uh, you're getting, you know, smaller banks getting gobbled up by big big banks. You're getting the big banks. Um, getting bailed out by the central banks by loading these toxic assets onto their balance sheets. They think that a lot of people seem to think that this sort of, you know, this gives stability to the system. But just like a Jenga tower, the more sort of top heavy it gets, the more brittle it gets. So, it, you know, you, you can have um, any number of, of situations come up. You could have a flashpoint in Taiwan. You could, again, you could have an invasion of Ukraine. You could have um, COVID. You could have all of these sort of, you know, again, black swan events, but if the system is brittle, it doesn't take a lot to bring the whole tower crashing down, which is sort of what we're seeing now. Fundamentally, um, I believe that the entire system, and it's not just me saying this, the numbers show this pretty clearly, the system is bankrupt. Um, So if you just look at debt to GDP globally, it's at 400%. So uh, that's a 5x. There's 5x more debt than there is global uh, GDP. If you look at the individual central banks, their balance sheets have ballooned over the past few years. Um, the U.S. alone, I mean, it went from uh, four trillion uh, in 2020 to eight and a half trillion today. So the Fed's balance sheet has pretty much doubled in um, in just the past uh, three years. So this really goes to show that. We're seeing the centralization. We're seeing these assets get loaded up. They're getting kicked up one level higher, one level higher. And at some point, you run out of entities that can bail out the system. At this point, sure, you can get a JP Morgan. Let's face it, it's actually the Fed that's backstopping this. Um, I think the, the FDIC, they financed the deal to begin with with $50 billion and they guaranteed 13 billion in losses. It's pretty much the same deal as what happened when Credit Suisse went belly up and UBS bailed them out. It wasn't really UBS bailing them out. It was being backstopped by the Swiss National Bank, by the SMB. They also made similar guarantees. They guaranteed up to 200 billion in losses. They extended a credit line to, to facilitate the deal. That's really the only way um, this this sort of deal can, can happen. Um, I think any sort of private enterprising um, organization wouldn't buy a, you know, something that's fundamentally bankrupt, which, you know, in a yeah. um, fractional reserve system, any bank pretty much is by definition, meaning they can't make good on their debts to depositors. That is by definition. So the only way that these consolidations, these bailouts can happen is from the, from the very top. And with each credit cycle, uh, with each instance, it's, it kind of goes up one level higher. And at some point, you, you kind of run out of you run out of runway. And the very last sort of pressure valve for the entire thing is the currency itself, which we've seen in, in plenty of places around the world. Okay, definitely want to circle back to what it means for currencies and therefore what it means for gold and Bitcoin. But let's focus a little bit more on the triggers here that could bring down this Jenga tower, as you say it. And there is a lot of concern about the commercial real estate sector. Charlie Munger, Berkshire Hathaway's vice chair, he is warning of a brewing storm in the U.S. commercial property market. He said that American banks are full of what he calls bad loans. And as property prices fall, he's expecting defaults there. And Elon Musk recently echoing that sentiment in an interview with Tucker Carlson before he and Fox parted ways. Let's take a look at what Elon Musk had to say. We really haven't seen the commercial real estate shoe drop. That's more like an anvil, not a shoe. Um, so the, the stuff we've seen thus far <laughs> actually hasn't even, it, 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 it's, it's only slightly uh, um, real estate portfolio degradation. Uh, th- th- but that will become a very serious thing later this year, in my, in my view. Right. An anvil, not a shoe, is yet to drop. And keeping in mind, Andrew, that the lion's share of commercial property loans are in fact provided by small banks, according to Capital Economics, that about $1.9 trillion are provided by small banks. So help us understand how property prices declining, how a crack in the commercial real estate sector could trigger a bigger collapse. Break that down for us. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I think Elon Musk is spot on. Um, To understand why 
mortgages, mortgage-backed securities, why they're so important to the system. We sort of have to take a step back and understand how the base layer of the system is structured. Uh, we are not on a hard money standard at the moment. We are on a fractional reserve system. We're on a fiat system where money is essentially debt. Those two things are equivalent. Money is nothing other than a, a promise of future repayment, which is exactly what a mortgage is, which is exactly what government debt is and U.S. treasuries are. So those two things, treasuries and mortgages, they really sit at the base layer of the system. And one of when one of those pillars start to get wobbly, that's when, as we were talking about, the, this Jenga tower really um, starts getting into trouble. And a few ways that it can start getting rickety is if uh, defaults start to pick up. We saw that in 2008. You're seeing it all over the country um, with you know, just the simple fact that remote working is such a big deal. That means that there's a lot of open office space. I think in San Francisco, I saw a, cr a crazy estimate that 50% of office space is, is um, vacant. So uh, certainly when those uh, when it comes time to rolling those mortgages over, they're not gonna do that. Um, we've also seen major um, real estate uh, providers um, declare bankruptcy uh, in recent times. So you know, if that trend continues, it, it essentially means that within the banks, they're, what they're using as collateral, their collateral uh, layer st starts to come apart. And um, that's, that's okay. Um, there's pretty tricky accounting rules that are meant to sort of deal with that. Uh, we've seen that with the health maturity rules that got implemented where the, where the uh, regulators are essentially saying that as long as you're you know, not looking to sell these before maturity, um, you know, you can value them nominally, you can value them at, at book value, not at market value. Uh, that doesn't work as well when people start withdrawing funds, when they're asking for their deposits back, and it also doesn't work when those, uh, when those uh, mortgages actually mature. So that's going to be a massive problem. I think the other big problem is that other side of the collateral layer, which is uh, government debt. So as we know, the uh, the uh, federal funds rate um, got hiked at the quickest pace in history. Uh, we're at, you know, getting close to 6% now, which makes government debt a lot more expensive. And um, you're seeing already that the, uh, the US federal debt uh, out of the total 31 trillion, 16 trillion is maturing in the next three years and 30% is maturing in the next six months. And when those need to get ro rolled over again, it's gonna get a lot more expensive. And um, we've already seen, so, you know, banks that bought into these uh, low yielding uh, government bonds, they essentially got wiped out when we saw this massive hike. That was sort of the one shoe to drop. The other shoe to drop is when the government essentially funding itself just gets too expensive. Yeah, shoes to drop and, and an anvil when the commercial real estate sector, as Elon Musk calls it, uh, just to correct you there, apparently the average office vacancy rate in San Francisco, the worst affected city, is uh, in the first quarter of 2023 was 18.6%. New York has a vacancy rate of 10.7%. Uh, that's at least according to fdintelligence.com. So yeah, to your point, uh, we're having major vacancies still in commercial real estate. And if we have tightening credit and if we have a recession and a slowdown, stands to reason that that is only going to be exacerbated. And of course, Andrew, all eyes are on the Fed then, because if the Fed follows through on the increase as expected in its next meeting, that will mark five percentage points worth of hikes in a 14 month period. And that is the fastest tightening cycle since the early 1980s. So what are you expecting from the Fed? Well, exactly. So I think uh, what the Fed has communicated and what markets are pricing in, those sort of, the, those match each other. So another, I mean, we'll, we'll see later this week, but another 25 basis points could be in the cars at least. Uh, that's it. That seems to be the consensus. It's what happens after that. That's where opinions um, sort of go apart. So the Fed is posturing hawkish. At the very least, they're indicating if they're not going to raise, uh, they're going to keep, keep it at these levels for the foreseeable future. I think there was also some leaked footage of, of uh, Fed Chair Powell that came out where he basically echoed that sentiment that he intended to hike 
uh, potentially twice, but then keep rates at a level um, at this sort of level for for longer than you know markets mar might anticipate. And markets have their own opinion. They're already pricing in that uh, the Fed funds rate is going to get dropped uh, later this this year. So we'll see. It, I think it depends on uh, you know how much more the situation deteriorates. So you know I don't know how many more banks it'll take to fail for you know, for the Fed's hand to get forced. So I think we'll just have to sit tight and, and see the markets have certainly um, made their bets. So how do we get to a scenario which you say is a probability or a possibility of 100 plus annual inflation within the next two or three years when we're seeing a Fed that is seemingly committed to tackling inflation? How do we get to that scenario which you forecast could happen 100 plus annual inflation in the next two or three years? How does that happen? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it depends a little bit how you define inflation. That's always the longstanding argument. If you just look at, if you take sort of the, um, you, you take the Austrian definition of inflation, you're just looking at the money supply, then certainly we're getting already pretty close there. We were talking about how much the Fed balance sheet has grown, which is a pretty good proxy for quote unquote money printing, uh, which went from 4 trillion in 2020 and doubled within just three years to eight and a half trillion. And it's, we're sort of in the perfect storm here for the Fed's balance sheet to really keep to keep ballooning. So we're, we're already seeing it with these bailouts. Um, at some point, you know, these toxic assets, they're going to be absorbed. Uh, by the by the by the Fed, um, especially as we were saying earlier with Elon Musk's comments, if uh, any more of these mortgages uh, start blowing up at some point, you know those are going to have to be absorbed as well, and those could be astronomical figures. Then we're also there's um, global macro sort of um, factors that could come into play. You're seeing what's happening with the, with BRICS countries. They're making moves to get off of a dollar standard. Potentially, that would mean a lot less demand for U.S. Treasuries. Uh, of course, China was one of the biggest uh, buyers of U.S. Treasuries. They stopped buying pretty much back in 2011, and they've already been reducing. But that could just be a you know a small uh, indicator of what's to come if some of these other nations follow suit. I think there's a, a pretty big cue uh, also for developing nations that seem interested in getting BRICS membership. So then the question is, you know, where um, where is this appetite for um, for treasuries going to come from? There's going to be a big hunt for uh, balance sheet capacity. And the as we've seen with these bank collapses, banks certainly aren't able to do it. They already got burnt when they bought U.S. treasuries uh, at low yielding rates a few years ago. That's actually what triggered this this entire meltdown. And um, the only sort of balance sheet that remains open would be the Feds. So um, in the scheme of things, it's still a pretty low ratio because we have the US dollar has sort of that status as reserve currency. And you have all of these nations that want to save um, in, in dollar denominated debt. But if that starts to reduce or that starts to go away, then the the Fed is going to have to jump in and, and make up the difference. It's currently the Fed balance sheet, I believe, is 30 percent to, to GDP, which is relatively low compared to other central banks. So I think you have you have the Bank of England, you have the ECB, which are creeping up on 100 percent. So about a 3x on that. You have the Bank of China, which is over 200 percent. So there's certainly room to grow there. But as 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 far as inflation goes, that is certainly going to spike, even if, you know, the U.S. sort of grows its balance sheet, the, the Fed's balance sheet, com somewhat comparatively close to what uh, other Western nations have, what, what the ECB has, what, what, the, what the BOE has, uh, that would be a 3x. So from that perspective, yeah, absolutely. Um, that would be very inflationary. It would certainly be inflationary for asset prices. I think in the last few years, we've, we've also seen some of that trickle down into consumer prices. So it's even affecting those. So I think there's a lot more to come. OK, so how much of this 100 plus annual inflation in two to three years is linked to the idea of de-dollarization, which we are seeing accelerate? Uh, to your point, the BRICS are looking at putting together a global reserve currency, potentially backed by commodities. We have 19 countries 
vying for BRICS membership, the BRICS meeting uh, in the summer in South Africa to hash things out. It's still a long way away from them actually getting their act together. But if we throw in this de-dollarization trend, bank collapsing, inflation, recession equaling stagflation, and then of course, we've got this debt ceiling idea, which if it doesn't get raised, it does not exactly instill a lot of faith in the US government, which is of course what essentially backs the US dollar, faith in the US government. It seems like that's potentially a perfect storm brewing here. No, it absolutely is. And I think these these macro headwinds, these geopolitical headwinds, it just adds fuel to the fire. I mean, the this Fed balance sheet expansion that we've seen, this is pretty much before um, all of this, pardon my language, crap has hit the fan. And as mentioned, the last three years, it's already doubled. So I think if if the appetite abroad goes away for, for this type of debt, um, and if the banking system, as we as we evidently see, isn't capable of absorbing that, then all of that is going to land on the Fed's balance sheet. I mean, just ask yourself, you know, how many how, how many trillion dollar companies were around before 2018? There were none. Apple was the first one in 2018, mm-hmm. and now there are six of them. And that just happened, you know, in the last five years. So, in other words, App- Apple was found in 1976. It took 40 years to get to to one trillion market cap, and then it took four years to get to three trillion. So it did a three X on its market. And all of that, And if, if you look at the S&P um, and you look at the Fed's balance sheet, there's pretty much a, a there's a 97%, you know, explanatory yeah. correlation there. So it, it's it's quite clear that in, for at least for asset prices, absolutely, we're, we're going to see if, if this trend continues, we could see tremendous inflation, uh, asset price inflation. It remains to be seen how, how that is going to translate for consumer goods, which I think most people care about. They care about, you know, what what does it cost to fill up their gas tank? What does it cost to go to go get groceries? That remains to be seen. We, we've seen pretty significant numbers, numbers that a few years ago you would have called fiction. Uh, in, in the UK, I think we just had um, grocery price inflation of 17 percent, a little more even year over year. Um, and in the US, we all the CPI almost touched 10 percent. And those are just the official numbers. So, you know, who who, who knows what, what the real story is? CPI is a little tricky. The way it works is, you know, if if steak gets too expensive, people stop buying steak. Let's say they they start they start buying um, ground beef and then, you know, CPI comes out and they go, oh, people aren't really consuming steak anymore. So we should take steak out because that's no longer representative. We should, we should put ground beef in. And then, you know, big surprise, CPI comes in a lot not a lot lower when, you know, actual inflation, of course, or price inflation rather, is um, could, could be very severe. Right. As you say, this is just um, the government representation of what inflation is. And even by that measure, it is not looking good. Uh, you talk about filling up gas tanks, of course, a lot of this is exacerbated by the move to decarbonize by lack of investment in the energy sector under the idea of ESG, under the idea of climate change. How does that then fit into this picture? Yeah, I think it's, again, if if you go back to the fundamental question of how is the entire financial system structured, it's also just playing the same idea out. So if you're in the business of exporting debt, if you're in the business of printing money, that's a lot more convenient than having to, you know, actually build up an infrastructure of energy to, domestically. So you can have these ESG policies, which interestingly, we're seeing sort of fall out of favor. So you're seeing reports about um, you know about some of these big asset allocators. They're they're uh, they're adjusting their their set of rules about what type of investments fit into their in, in, into their um, point of view and, and which don't. And it, it's it's sort of we're seeing a move away from ESG. I think because we are coming up against the hard reality. But yeah, for for many years, I think it, it, it's much easier to print and import rather than to make long term investments in in these sort of um, big expensive infrastructure deals that in the long run are extremely important. They sit at the base of the economy. You, you need cheap energy um, to, 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 um, 
which would ironically help offset inflation. So yeah. if you could get, yeah, if you, if you could, co- if you could get costs of energy down to, you know, one cent per kilowatt hour or something, that would go a long way to offsetting um, what we're seeing here. But, but again, we don't have that type of um, infrastructure b- because, um, because of these systemic failures in our financial, financial system, which set the wrong incentives. And of course, the climate change narrative, which is disincentivizing investment in these uh, critical sectors of the uh, energy market. Let's talk about how you see all of this potentially paving the way to a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, which as a reminder to our viewers, is a form of fiat currency controlled by a central bank but that the government is through it able to monitor every single transaction made, obliterating anonymity, and that it's also potentially programmable, meaning that the government can then decide when and when this uh, currency will or will not work, depending on certain criteria. So you're seeing a collapse in the banking sector. You're saying it's going to lead to consolidation and potentially pave the way to a central bank digital currency. And whilst this banking crisis is happening, the Fed also happened to push ahead and launch with its Fed now payment system. So tie that all in together for us, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you hit the nail on the head. It really goes to this entire trend of consolidation, of kicking it up one level higher. So you're seeing small banks getting eaten by bigger banks, getting absorbed by the central bank. And at some point, people are going to ask themselves, you know, if at the end of the day, if my counterparty is the government itself, if it's the government that's facilitating this takeover of of Credit Suisse by UBS, it's the government that's facilitating this, um, this buyout. Of, of First Republic by J.P. Morgan, then you know I might as well have an account with with the government because you know especially also these these larger asset allocators they don't get paid um, to take on counterparty risk so if they have any way of reducing it then certainly having you know having the central bank or having the Fed as your direct counterparty that that only makes sense and I think you're right so during this entire debacle, you would think that the the Fed would be preoccupied with sort of firefighting exercises, um, which certainly they are. But at the same time, they they found the uh, the time in their in their busy schedule to to announce um, this exciting new service that they're launching. Uh, it's called it's called Fed Now, which a lot of people are calling a precursor to to CBDC. It's a pay a pay um, it's, it's a closed payment system um, where you have these. Particip- I think 10,000 participating institutions, uh, which certainly entail um, the last remi- remaining 5,000 FDIC, FDIC insured banks, they would be part of that. So um, that would take people one step closer to directly transacting on the, on the Fed's balance sheet. And I think it's also in their view critical to getting a hold um, of this entire situation. So if you're thinking back to the idea of the, of the Jenga tower and you keep piling up the blocks, at some point, you're going to have to have um, a one centralized system uh, platform that the that the the central banks can control. Um, you know, there's a few ways to look at it. I think, in terms of reducing counterparty risk, short term, sure, it makes sense. That's that's the way that the incentives are pointing. Uh, but long term, those could turn into uh, could could turn into uh, slaughterhouses and killing pens that you know people's savings are being essentially pulled into. And uh, if we're going, if if we think back, um, the, this this perfect you know storm of 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 massive inflation. Once you have that sort of centralized um, that kind of centralized system, it just turns into a massive honeypot where it can fall victim to whatever the political fashions of the day are. And that usually entails expensive programs and money printing. So that really would be carte blanche. All right, go back to that um, slaughterhouses and killing pens metaphor that you had there. Elaborate on that. Yeah, exactly. So it, it goes back to the idea that thinking, you know, when when these big bailouts are happening or when central banks are absorbing these toxic assets onto their balance sheet, that this is you know, giving stability to the system. But what it's really doing is making the entire system a lot more top heavy and a lot more brittle. So people, 
you know, when when they see their um, when they see that their life savings could be in danger, and they they see these they see their banks collapse. That's when bank bank runs bank runs happen. They they pull out their deposits, but they still have to. They're still in the system, right? Those deposits have to go somewhere. So, um, what better place to put it than with the quote unquote uh, safest, you know, um, institution of them all, which is government itself. So that's sort of how that's how the, how gravity works um, in this scenario, and it just keeps playing out until you have one centralized system, one, you know, a CBDC where everybody has their, their life savings. But the, the irony of it all is that the most indebted entity is government itself. So when, you know, those debts can't be paid anymore, uh, we haven't even talked about unfunded liabilities. Um, U.S. debt to GDP is already 130%, but that doesn't, doesn't even factor in, you know, all the, it doesn't factor in, um, uh, Social Security and and again all these unfunded liabilities that yeah. are going to come due at some point, and the the last remaining pressure valve uh, is the currency itself. So that is when um, inflation happens. That is when the money printing really g- goes into overdrive, and that's essentially when people's life savings life savings get inflated away. And if you're if there's no more competition, if you just have this one centralized system, there's uh, really nowhere to go because the fire escapes have been sealed off, the emergency exits have been closed. Um, you're you're going to get burnt down with the building. So you get forced into a central bank digital currency, which is positioned as a way to sort of save the day, is is what you're saying. In uh, with regards to the Fed launching Fed now, I mean, to be fair, they have been working on it for a while. So it may just be a happy coincidence that they're ready to launch just as uh, we're seeing all of these major cracks in the banking system. But in what time period do you anticipate this happening if this does, in fact, happen? We've had Edward Dowd on the show. He's been saying that he expects there to be a total of six banks in the U.S., potentially in about three years time and is painting a similar scenario that you do. What is your timeline for this to play out in? Yeah, I I think it's hard to put an exact date on it, but I would say it's probably sooner than later. These things tend to play out uh, a lot more rapidly, especially when you get into the end of a credit cycle as we're in right now. Again, U.S. debt to GDP is at its highest levels ever. I think the closest was uh, in 1946, after World War II, it was at 110%. So um, it, it's even higher than than then, but there was a massive difference. I mean, back in the, in, the 40, in the late 40s and in the 50s, the US came out victorious after World War, after, after World War II, and there was massive upside potential. It, you know, the dollar became the reserve currency. Um, it, it was a growth phase. This is the inverse of that. We're sort of coming to the end of a credit cycle, and there's really um, no place to go again other than to centralize and um, to load load up on this debt because um, it's not even a question of if if the entire system is essentially bankrupt. It's not a question of how does how does it get paid back. It's more of a question of how do these losses get allocated? And what's happening at the moment is every time there's a bailout, every time these these debts get kicked one level higher, what's essentially happening is, happening is that the the losses are being allocated to the public. And the final stage of that is again the currency getting debased, which is sort of the is the the ultimate you know um, is the is the ultimate default. Right. Okay. So I will take this point to then ask you to make your case for Bitcoin, because that is what you think is the way to get through this. So make the case for why Bitcoin is the answer that you propose. Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to come at this, but I'm going to dive into the entire to the counterparty risk aspect of this. So, you know, er, er, I think erroneously, a lot of people think again that having the government as your as the ultimate counterparty is um, is the safest way to 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 go about it. Which, as we've discussed in the long term, has I think a lot more um, a lot more downside than upside. So, you know, it it would be perfect if you had 
some other asset class that had zero counterparty risk, you know, that was outside of the system, um, which is like, oh, actually, we we do have that. It, it actually, it, it, it's Bitcoin and it, it was, um, it, it launched as a result of, of 2008 in the aftermath of, of that last financial collapse. And it's, it's still up and running, it's still here. It was actually at the time a, a great alternative. It was very early days, but it would have been a great alternative for people looking to, to exit the system, people that you know, had that long-term vision, that, that understood that this bailout was not gonna be a one-off, that this was part of a longer trend that would continue, that you know, with each sort of credit cycle, it, the system would keep contracting, keep consolidating. Um, and, uh, and it continues to be so. So uh, Bitcoin's still up and running. It's been doing so consistently for 13 years now, 14 years almost. So I think in terms of people looking for an alternative to the current system, that is a great option, as is gold, of course. Yeah, definitely want to touch on gold. But let's stay with Bitcoin. What then is your price outlook for Bitcoin if you're seeing this potential collapse happen by, and I, again, it's a probability that you're saying or a possibility that you're saying in the next three years, what would that mean for the price of Bitcoin then Oh, in, the, in three years time? Yeah, you, you know, what, what I've learned from these past few cycles is that people, including myself, are not very good at making price predictions. I think every single price, including people that, you know, seem to know what, and I'm sure they do know what they're talking about, but Honestly, this last time around, everybody was dead wrong. They were making it, calling for astronomical. I remember um, when when Bitcoin hit its its peak of um, you know in the sixty seven thousand, yeah, sixty nine thousand, almost yeah, exactly, almost touched seventy k. People were calling for um, one hundred fifty, two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand. Of course, they were dead wrong. And then on the flip side, when it when it dropped to 25, 20, 16,000, people were saying, you know, we're we're holding out for 10,000. So, and of course, they've been left in the dust. It, it more than it almost doubled since then. So, uh, price predictions are hard. I'm 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 gonna go with, um, you know, if if you look at some of these more conservative estimates, I, I forget which uh, bank came out yesterday and said 100k is plausible. That doesn't sound too crazy to me. I think that might even be a bit of a disappointing number. Um, I can't make a prediction here, but I, again, I think 100K is probably on the low side, um, just 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 given um, what, what we're seeing in, happening in traditional finance and the way that Bitcoin is positioned as an alternative to that. And given its small market cap, given uh, again, given how early it is, I think there's a ton of upside potential there. You're seeing countries adopt it so yeah, I think 100K would be on the low side. 100K in three years time. Oh no, within the next 12 months. Within the next 12 months, okay. That's a much more bold prediction than within three years time. I believe Standard Charter was saying that Bitcoin could hit uh, 100,000 by the end of uh, 2024. Um, but okay, I will not necessarily hold you to that price prediction. And I always applaud the guests that do actually come on the show and have uh, the gumption to make a price and timeline prediction. But, uh, and, and to your point, uh, we've actually just learned that uh, Bhutan, which is a, a kingdom in the Himalayas, has confirmed that it's actually been mining Bitcoin for years. So, you know, we're, we're starting to perhaps see um, this idea of countries looking at Bitcoin as an asset. Of course, El Salvador is sort of leading the trend there. But, on the flip side of this, and before we get to gold, what could derail this thesis of yours for Bitcoin? What would happen that, as I say, renders this whole approach and theory pretty much upside down? Yeah, I think if, um, again, I, I think Bitcoin is, is an alternative to the existing system. We, we've had heart money standards, but we've, we've never tested this, this type of this type of um, digital gold. So I, I think it, it kind of goes to sort of uh, more foundational, you know, uh, questions about, about humanity. I, th I think there's a reason that we do have these credit cycles quite, quite obviously. Um, there, there's something in human nature um, that, that wants credit, that, that 
maybe in some way also thrives on it. I think it goes goes to the idea that it, it's it's a very attractive idea to want something for nothing, which which credit promises. So if if there's any we, we I would argue that we've seen um, a gold standard fail because people do want to use credit, and there's really no way to to give um, to to, to to margin call that um, with something like gold, there's no there's no way to give a no confidence vote. Gold is going to be locked up with your custodian. You have no way of, you know, reliably auditing it. So you you have to deal with these um, with these layers of credit that are, that are built on top. If something similar were to happen to Bitcoin, that would be disappointing. Um, but essentially, we would just be restarting the same uh, the same system that we we've always had. There's there's something about human nature that seems cyclical, so that that could be that could be one way. But at least in the meantime, if we do settle on on a hard money standard on on Bitcoin standard, say, um, you know, it might fail long term. Um, let's call it due to, to human failing, but at least in, in the short term or to, to midterm, it could be a very good way of, um, of acting as a pressure valve to, to, this, to this imploding uh, debt system so, we currently So have. let's unpack this. You made an interesting comment there, um, which I understood that if we start to build all of these derivative products off the core asset of Bitcoin and have futures products linked to it and ETFs, that that in a way could be very problematic for Bitcoin and uh, its integrity and that it follows the same pattern then. Is, is that what I hear you say there? Yeah, that is to say there's absolutely nothing wrong with these products. I think, in fact, they're great products that can they can be extremely helpful um, for hedging purposes uh, to get around market inefficiencies that you might have temporarily. Uh, they can be very valuable tools. I think the problem is that when that market starts to outgrow, you know, the actual um, collateral right. uh, layer itself, that's when you do run into that sort of trouble. And I think the way that w could happen possibly is if too few people take self custody of their of their Bitcoin, where they wouldn't have the option to to again margin call um, or to give a no confidence vote to this, you know, booming. Right. Um, credit layer that's growing on top. That being said, you know that's something that could take decades. So in the meantime, I still think even if long term, you know, it doesn't work out, I think there's um, in the short to midterm, there's a, a lot of attractive um, aspects to this. Yeah, if you get to a point where there's more paper Bitcoin than real Bitcoin, that's very problematic and lends the Bitcoin price to be manipulated, as some would argue has been the case with gold and silver, that there's more paper gold and paper silver out there. And that's why those markets have been susceptible to manipulation. Again, before I get to gold, because I know our viewers want to hear your thoughts on that. If we don't have this chaos, which I hope we don't have, if this all doesn't unravel, what does that mean for Bitcoin? Can Bitcoin in your mind, still do well if we somehow hobble through this? I, I think so. So, you know, th there's a few ways that they've been able to keep these. If, if you think about the central banks juggling, uh, juggling, juggling balls, keeping these balls up in the air, they've been able to, to do this for decades. There's certainly, certainly scenarios we could think of where their runway would be extended. Um, one such scenario would be massive productivity gains. So, uh, you know, you could paint a scenario where artificial intelligence is increasing our productivity by 20x. You could imagine that, you know, um, w w with the supply chains breaking, with with on French shoring, you have a huge push, uh, and you have a lot of money printing. Funny enough, and, and a lot of inflation that sort of finances these these big infra government led infrastructure. Uh, deals where uh, the energy sector is getting boosted and you're lowering those uh, those costs of energy again down to like one or two cents. Uh, that would give uh, that would put a lot of downward pressure on prices. So that could give a lot more runway to to printing. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's as Greg Foss likes to say, it's just it's I forget eleventh or twelfth grade math. So at some point, um, the interest payments they just they get astronomical because it has a compounding effect. And at some point um, that really puts a lot of pressure, no, no matter, even if you know you have a huge productivity boost where you, you know, you're, you're, you're increasing productivity by 20X, 
the debt keeps it's it keeps compounding, it keeps doubling, it keeps doubling. At some point, productivity is not going to be able to keep up with it. That could be in 10 years, that could be in 20 years, that could be in 30 years. But at that point, you are going to need um, a, a pressure valve, which again, I think Bitcoin could, right. could be that pressure. Do valve. the math, as Greg Foss likes to say. So, Andrew, why wouldn't that release be gold? For argument's sake, I mean, we are seeing central banks buying gold at record levels in 2022. That trend continuing into 2023. Why would that valve not be gold, which has been around for thousands and thousands of years, proving that it is a safe haven and store of value? Why wouldn't the reset go to gold? Yeah, I think again, yeah, gold. As you said, gold has been around forever. Um, I, I also respect the entire gold bug community. I think they've really been they've they've been doing um, they've really been in the trenches. They've been doing a lot of work. I as a, as a Bitcoiner, I almost feel bad. Sort of, I feel like I'm coming in at at the end of a fight and sort of just you know, um, uh, uh, yeah, taking taking all of the. Uh, trying to take all the honors or, but, but yeah, no, um, gold bucks have been fighting the good fight. Um, from a technical perspective, I just think that Bitcoin has superior features in most respects. Um, portability, of course, lightning fast. Um, you can sort in, in your brain, you can memorize a, a seed phrase. Um, but there's an argument to be made that gold might be, you know, superior in terms of fungibility. So there's some um, some concerns about specific transactions being identified, and then on the on the Bitcoin layer, and then that sort of um, being used to identify individual labeling individual coins, which which again would hurt fungibility, obviously. But I think that. Bitcoin being a technology, as it gets developed, also as uh, the, the privacy aspect gets built out, that is that is probably going to negate that aspect. But but certainly, um, gold has good arguments. We've also seen central banks buying gold at record rates. Um, so I, I think for a reset on the national level, absolutely, I think gold could profit from that. Um, however, you know, most people they they. They either can't buy gold. They certainly they don't want to keep it in their house. They don't want to physically store it. So I think for the population at large, uh, Bitcoin is probably the answer here. Well, one of the biggest issues with Bitcoin, though, is that it does rely on electricity and the Internet. That is what a big pushback from gold proponents would say. That we, when we have a completely digital system, you're running the risk of power outages, blackouts, being able to be taken off the grid. What say you, Andrew? Yeah, it, it goes to, people say Bitcoin is the optimistic sort of reset scenario. Gold would be the pessimistic reset scenario. I mean, you're right, if for some reason, you know, the internet goes um, goes away, uh, we, we get thrown back into the stone age, then yeah, absolutely, you would probably um, want gold over Bitcoin at that point, but presumably you might want canned food and, and bullets even more. That's um, true, but you can have intermittent uh, periods of internet outage, which could also potentially impact this. Uh, for the record, for the viewers that don't know, I am both in the Bitcoin and in the gold camp. So what would you say then, given all of this, and as you mentioned, central banks buying gold, and as you brought up the BRICS, and then potentially looking at a reserve asset potentially uh, backed by a basket of commodities, including gold, still hasn't been officially announced. What would be your gold outlook then? Yeah, I think if, so. If, if your 12-month outlook for Bitcoin is potentially $100,000, and again, I applaud you for putting your neck out there, what is your 12-month outlook for gold? I don't think 3K is crazy. If, if 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 we're going to put a number on it, um, not it's saying it's a prediction, but three k doesn't doesn't sound too too crazy. Okay, I mean that's that's a pretty modest increase uh, if we're looking at uh, Bitcoin triple. Um, yeah, it's a, bigger, well, it's a bigger market cap though, so yeah. there's there's less room to grow. Right, and gold currently struggling uh, to really push through the two thousand level, but uh, we'll see what happens after the Fed's announcement later this week. Andrew, I hope you're wrong 
for most of your predictions, but I do thank you for coming on the show and giving us your analysis and your perspective. Really appreciate it, Andrew Axelrod. And for those that want to hear more from you, how can they do that? Yeah, so probably best is LinkedIn. Just look me up, Andrew Axelrod on LinkedIn. I post pretty much daily. So um, comment a lot on, on market news that's going on, a lot of global mac macro commentary, um, also mostly through a Bitcoin lens. So you can you can follow me, you can click the notification bell and, and you'll get pinged when I when I post. All right, Andrew, thank you so much. Andrew Axelrod, appreciate it. And of course, thanks again to our sponsors, Prime XBT. I'm Michelle McCory. Thank you for watching. We'll see you soon. On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Prime XBT, the leading cryptocurrency trading platform.